Hey guys, how are you? Here I am today back with another video on the book The Bates Method Better Eyesight Without Glasses which is written by W.H. Bates. Like I said in my previous video, today I'll be discussing the facts stated in Chapter 1 along with a technique called Simultaneous Retinoscopy. This video will be a bit longer than the others because in this I'll be going a little bit into the detail. Now it's been a couple of centuries since ophthalmology, which is the branch of medicine which deals with the diagnosis and treatment of eye disorders, has been seeking some method to contradict the ravages inflicted upon the human eye by the civilization. The Germans, to whom the matter has been of vital military importance, have spent millions of dollars studying and researching to try and find a way out of this, but to no avail. Now, I mentioned that to the Germans this was a matter of military importance. You may have wondered why. Well, there's a little story behind it. World War II was going on, which by the way lasted from 1939 to 1945. The German Luftwaffe, which is now known as the German Air Force, was frequently conducting air raids on the United Kingdom, which was why blackouts were in effect across the country to minimize visibility of targets on the ground, due to which many researches were conducted by the government of Germany to improve the eyesight of the fighter pilots to such an extent so that they could see in dim light too. But unfortunately, no such proven or foolproof method was found despite spending such a lot of money. Now before moving ahead, I'll try to make you really clear on what exactly is refraction. Refraction is basically the deviation of light waves as they enter the eye. So instead of all the light rays coming and converging onto the retina to form an image, what they do is they get diverged in different directions due to which the person can't see clearly. So glasses, what they do is they have either concave or convex lenses in them depending on which type of refractive error you're suffering from which help all the light rays to come and converge on one point onto the retina. So by the prevailing method of treatment, which is by means of artificial lenses, very little has ever been claimed for them except that they merely neutralize the effect of various refractive conditions of the eye, exactly how crutches enable a lame man to walk. As long back as in 1916, some ophthalmologists understood that glasses didn't do much in either preventing an increase in the error of refraction or in the development of serious complications. Now, every ophthalmologist of any experience or even you people might have heard of someone whose eyesight suddenly started recovering or it got even worse and changed from one form to another. All ophthalmologists come across such cases very frequently, but these facts don't fit the theories out there because all of them say that your number will never decrease and will always increase. They also don't explain why sometimes one form changes to another spontaneously. So what do they do? In most cases they choose to ignore these facts or for the more curious patients they bolster up all theories and false facts until the poor person gets totally caught up in them. In a majority of cases they choose just to explain it away and I'm sure you people might have faced this sometime or the other. So the theories taught to us in school say that the eye changes its focus for vision at different distances by altering the curvature of the lens and in trying to seek an explanation for the error of refraction Theorists hit upon a very brilliant idea and attributed it wholly to the curvature changing capacity of the lens. Now I'll be coming to some of the different types of errors of refraction. In hypermetropia, which is also commonly called farsightedness, although it isn't completely true because such a person can't see distant things properly too. So in hypermetropia, the eyeball is too short from the front to the back. This requires a little bit of physics. So all the light rays, the convergent ones coming from nearby objects and the parallel ones coming from distant objects focus behind the retina instead of upon it because the eyeball is flattened. In myopia, which I am suffering from, the divergent rays from the nearby objects do focus on the retina but the parallel ones coming from distant objects do not reach it. And in my case, my right eye is more myopic than the left one. 
I've observed closely and I've noticed that it's also bulging a little bit. I'm a little worried about it. Now, both these conditions are supposed to be permanent. The former, congenital, and the latter, acquired. <laughs> but in my case, doctors say that my myopia is genetic because I got specs when I was just two years old. Now, if you've ever visited an eye specialist, you'll know that, well, most of them put some drops called atropine into your eyes first. Why so? Well, it's to paralyze the ciliary muscle, which changes the curvature of the lens, so that the doctor can diagnose latent hypermetropia and get rid of the apparent myopia. Coming to astigmatism, its sudden disappearance poses a really puzzling problem. Astigmatism in most cases is due to an unsymmetrical change in the curvature of the cornea, resulting in the failure to bring the light rays to focus at any point. According to the theories, the eye itself is supposed to possess only a limited ability to overcome it. Yet, astigmatism comes and goes with as much facility as other errors of refraction, like hypermetropia and myopia. Many studies have been undertook on this point, and Bates has also himself observed that people who, who seem to have hypermetropia and myopia at one time seem at other times not to have them, or to have them in lesser degrees. And it's well known too that astigmatism can be produced voluntarily too by some people. Bates says that with time he discovered that my, uh, hypermetropia and myopia, just like astigmatism, could be produced at will too. And also that myopia, as is believed, is not associated with the use of eyes at the near point, but with a strain to see distant objects, strain at the near point being associated with hypermetropia. Bates says that no error of refraction is ever a constant condition. While the lower degrees can be eliminated, the higher ones can be improved. Now Bates, in his 30 years of examining eyes at various reputed institutions, accumulated many such troubling facts which didn't coincide with the theories. But he, like other ophthalmologists, just couldn't ignore those facts. So finally, he undertook a series of observations upon human beings and some of the lower animals, the results of which convinced him that the lens is not a factor in accommodation. And yeah, of course, accommodation over here means the adjustment of the eye to see at different distances. So he was convinced that the lens is not a factor in accommodation and that the adjustment necessary for vision at different distances in the eye is much like it is in a camera. It is by a change in the length of the organ. This change being made by some external muscles on the outside of the eyeball and not by the ciliary muscle. Another convincing demonstration was of presbyopia, which is another error of refraction. It occurs mostly in later age when the lens loses its elasticity and becomes rigid, causing difficulty in accommodation and recession at the near point. Now, don't worry if you didn't understand what presbyopia is, because in my upcoming videos, I'll be dedicating one whole video to it. Now, Bates says that presbyopia is not due, due to an organic change in the eyeball or due to a change in the constitution of the lens, but due to a functional derangement in the muscles on the outside of the eyeball. And according to Bates, it can be eliminated. I'll be ending the facts on this note, and now I'll be coming to simultaneous retinoscopy. Now, when you visit your eye specialist, what he usually does is, he first instills atropine into your eyes, and then he checks a few things like focus, like your squint, or whatever. It depends. Then he asks you to come again after a few days when the effect of atropine wears out, and when you can see clearly, so that he can check if there's a change in your number, and if so, give you your new prescription. Then, when you visit him again, what does he do? He asks you to read the Snellen test card, which was invented by the celebrated Dutch ophthalmologist Herman Snellen. Then he asks you to wear a bulky trial frame, and he puts on various lenses and asks you which one's better. He's totally dependent upon your opinion. But simultaneous retinoscopy is done with the help of a retinoscope, which is an instrument which is used to measure the refraction of the eye. The retinoscope throws a beam of light into the eye 
by reflection from a mirror. On looking through the sight hole, one sees part of the pupil filled with light, which in normal human eyes is reddish yellow because this is the color of the retina. Unless the eye is exactly focused on the point from which it's being observed, one also sees a dark shadow at the edge of the pupil. And it is the behavior of this shadow which reveals the refractive condition of the eye when the mirror is moved in various directions. If the shadow moves in the opposite direction as that of the mirror, then the eye is myopic. If it moves in the same direction with the mirror, then it's either normal or hypermetropic. In case of hypermetropia, the movement is more pronounced than that of normality. And an expert can usually tell the difference between the two states merely by the nature of the movement. In astigmatism, the movement is different in different meridians. A meridian is basically a vertical plane projected forward from the poles of the eyeball. To determine the degrees of the error or to, or to distinguish correctly between hypermetropia and normality, or to differentiate between different types of astigmatism, it is usually necessary to experiment with a lens before the eyes of the subject. If the mirror is concave instead of plane, the movements described will be reversed. The plane mirror, however, is the most commonly used. While the evidence of the test card is entirely subjective, that of the retinoscope is entirely objective, depending in no way upon the statements of the patient. In short, while testing with the help of a test card requires a lot of time, the retinoscope can be used in both normal and abnormal conditions. Just in case you didn't understand simultaneous retinoscopy or you want to gain more clarity on it, you can click on the link given in the description below to watch a short informative video on it. So this is the end of this video and do subscribe to my channel and press the bell icon below to be notified as soon as I post my next video. And yeah, I almost forgot to tell you that from the next video onwards, I'll be giving you one tip at the end of each video to improve your eyesight that isn't given in the book. So till then, bye-bye.